Gracias, Juan. Y um, gracias to to a todos. Um, primero, me gustaría agradecer a Juan y Cristina y Miguel y Jesús y um, Javier y Andy para su opor, su hospitalidad durante mi visita, visita aquí a EBD. <laughs> Ahora, <laughs> hablo in, in inglés. <laughs> uh, sí. Um, uh, first, okay, switch to English. First, uh, I need to thank my graduate students. Um, can you understand? <laughs> okay, I need to thank the graduate students that helped with this particular uh, series of studies that I will talk about today. Okay, this is a, a, an obvious question when we talk about climate change, why Arctic nesting waders. Only yesterday, a report came out on the news that said that January was the January 2016 was the absolute warmest. And if you saw the map, the most change was in the Arctic at 27, 20, uh, degrees warmer than average in January 2016 than other Januaries. So crazy, uh, very, very much warmer. Um, but maybe you haven't seen this map which shows the probability of change from one habitat to another, and the same sort of scale with um, the highest probability of change, in fact, 100% in the Arctic regions of change from one biome to another. And so studying birds in that particular environment gives us the best opportunity to see how birds will re respond to changes in the environment because sometimes it will happen even in real time or over the course of a career like my own. And so if we then look at the subdivisions of habitat in the Arctic, it's not that they, the bird species there can all nest in every single habitat. In fact, they have specialized habitat requirements, so different habitats. And so each species probably only nests in one of these habitats, or maybe one or two. And so the restriction is even greater, and I'm particularly interested in the subarctic. And so these are below the Arctic Circle habitats, and these are even more restricted, just a few places where you have extensive subarctic habitat. And one of those places is in Canada. Um, in addition to that, so places where habitat is changing the most quickly restricted habitat um, requirements of birds. In addition, many of these species that nest here have, um, by, have disjunct breeding populations. So this is the wimbrel, similar to your curlew, and you get wimbrels here as well, but um, two disjunct breeding populations and fairly wide distributions. But here is another species, Calidris homantopus, which has very narrow habitat distributions even within that area. So then we have even more concerns about what will happen to those habitats. And then you also have population structuring like Dunlin. Dunlin occur here as well. You have European populations of Dunlin. This is a polar view, so a little different. Um, but these populations are are good, sub, are good subspecies. They look different than, I mean, they have different morphometrics than each other, and they have strong migratory connectivity, which means that particular populations, for example, this is in the United States, Estados Unidos, the western United States, this population winters in the west coast of the United States, uh, the lower part of the United States. This population actually winters in Alaska, and the population that I study winters in southeastern United States. So then you have these subdivisions of species as well, um, so, uh, which are good taxonomic units and should be preserved. So the habitats in the subarctic are range from um, these, which are old beach ridges with some trees. These are the most rare of the habitats, old beach ridges with trees. And then, oh, the picture's not very good, but um, 
so wetter areas with some boreal forest in the background, scattered trees, and then wet areas again with fewer trees, and then dry ridges right along the shore of Hudson Bay in this case, and these are tundra habitats for the plover's nest. And then you can have these wet sedge meadows um, with very few trees but encroaching shrubs. And then right on the coast to the intertidal zones that are just slightly above the high tide line. So this is a picture during high tide, but the birds can actually nest on some of these little platforms here. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today are some of the impacts of a changing subarctic climate in particular. And I'll talk mostly about this one, habitat selection, and how they are dealing with, if they are dealing with, a stru structural components of the niche that can all of a sudden become unfavorable. For example, due to sea level rise or shrub encroachment or, or more trees. I'll talk less about this, but I have one study where I'm going to talk about com potential competitors and predators. And then uh, this is a very popular explanation for uh, why birds in Arctic, migratory birds might be impacted by climate change, the so-called mismatch hypothesis when birds, they return to breeding areas and their food supply has already disappeared because it's emerged earlier than their arrival dates. So I'll also talk about that a little bit. Three study areas. The first is in Churchill, Manitoba on the west coast of Hudson Bay. And then I'll move over here to near the Alaska-Canada border uh, along the Beaufort Sea. And this is called the Mackenzie Delta, a large river system, the Mackenzie River. And in the Delta, there are many birds. And then finally, I'll move to here, which is in um, Nunavut, the newest of the territories in Canada. And it's a little island, which actually is very close to Ontario. This is the province of Ontario here. And then I'm going to go quickly back to, to um, Churchill, but you may not even notice that. <laughs> so Churchill is best known for these organisms and uh, climate change has had an effect on my research program because now these, these animals come in earlier because the sea ice comes, is melting earlier. They come into the study area and so uh, my students and myself, we carry guns when we go through the study area, shotguns because we need to protect ourselves from these animals. But they also are in areas where there are many, many species of shorebirds. And there, Churchill has 12 breeding species of shorebirds, including here's a whimbrel um, walking towards its nest. The second study area is, oh, so in Churchill, we have a very nice field station, um, well protected from the polar bears. There's internet, it's very, very comfortable. Here in the Mackenzie Delta, we basically, we fly in and then we land on a ridge and then we set up a camp and then we have a fence, a, polar, a bear fence around the camp, around the tents. Uh, and this is an area for grizzly bears. So we don't have to carry guns here because grizzly bears are not as dangerous. And then finally, a Gamaski Island, that little island I showed you, we have a permanent camp. It's a waterfowl camp, so we work on, um, the provincial government works on ducks from this camp, snow, and geese rather, Canada geese and snow geese. And so we tag along and we use the facilities and this is our bear fence. And there's a larger bear fence to keep the bears out of the helicopters because a couple of years ago, in fact, a bear smashed the windows of a helicopter. And they're very expensive, expensive pieces of equipment. So our study area, you can walk to it easily. This is basically the study area that we use. Okay, so for hab the habitat selection part of my talk then, I'm going to, because I have these species that vary in whether they're nesting close to the tree line or further from the tree line, I can compare those species. And I would anticipate that the species that, that nest closest to the tree line are going to be the ones that will first be affected by um, climate-induced habitat changes. And they will possibly be the first to be displaced. Unless they can show some adaptation or some flexibility in nest site selection. And that flexibility then also has to not have a negative impact on their reproductive success. 
So my general approach then will be to, for this part, is to show that species do indeed prefer the open habitats. And so that's basically a simple um, standard habitat selection study. And then look at the demographic consequences of a habitat selection. And then finally, determine whether there is uh, this adapt additive genetic variance that might suggest that the birds can in fact adapt to changes in the future. So that is, is there a genetic component to their habitat selection? So the first species I'll talk about is the wimbrel. And it nests in largely open but partially treed habitats. So it's the one that nests closest to the tree line. Um, nesting in open habitats, as with most of these birds, but this is a, a big shorebird, functions in predator detection. And they are also thought to be an umbrella species. So they have these, if a raven flies over, they fly up to the raven and then they chase the raven away. Both members of the pair fly up and chase the raven out of the area. So they're also considered an umbrella species, so other species can nest under them safely. So this is an interesting species. For this one, we have some historical information. So there were some early reports, and this is Churchill. This is the Churchill Airport, um, sorry, the Churchill Runway. It's a gravel runway. And this is an old uh, lake where they land float planes. So it's called the Landing Lake. Aeroplanes land here. And in the 50s and 60s, this area was considered the best area for wimbrel. So that's just uh, from the literature. And so many, many wimbrel nested here. No longer any wim wimbrel here. In the 1970s, there were 17 nests in this area here. By the 1990s, only five. And by the early 2000s, there were two or three pairs. And by the time my student uh, did her study, there were only two nests here, and it was one pair. And now this area is abandoned. So we were interested in whether there was some information to show that, in fact, the habitat had become more unfavorable. And so if you look at the site where they were, this is what it looks like. And this is the site where they still are. And over the Churchill, uh, since 1970 in Churchill, the temperature has risen and the number of degree days, which is important for tree growth, especially in May and uh, September when the trees grow a lot, uh, has increased significantly by a uh, summer month, uh, uh, the average for a summer month. And so there's been a... Uh, huge um, increase in the growing season for the trees there. And so one of the interesting uh, issues with trying to understand whether habitats have changed is that we don't actually have very good historical data. If you look at the papers on this, they're usually, um, they, they usually look at one old aerial photograph and then they look at the same place in another time. And that's what we have. And we have that here as well. So these are old photos, black and white contact prints that were done by the first researcher who studied Wimbrel in this area. And we contacted her and she happened to have them in her basement under Bajo La Casa. We, lucky, suerte, that we found these old photos. And then I had these old photos from 1986 from the same area. And then we did buy some satellite imagery from 2006. So we had three time periods of the exact same area. My student looked at these, and this is just a sampling. Indeed, the area has become much more treed over the three time periods. So this is the exact same spot, which you have to, it's tricky to do that. If you've done GIS, it's hard to actually get the exact same spot. And so that's what she's shown, that the, the number of trees and shrubs have increased significantly over that time period. And so we also show that this is a Wimbrel resource selection function showing the nest, Los Nidos, aquí en negro, and otra uh, random sites here. And you can see that the nests are in areas with fewer trees and fewer shrubs, with the exception of one nest, because there is some variability. But in general, they avoid trees and they avoid shrubs. And so we think this is good circumstantial evidence that they have been moving out of this area because of the, the, tree, the tree growth. And so 
Here's just a gra graphic showing 1970s. These were all the known nesting locations. By the 1990s, they'd moved further north. And then by 2006, there was only the one remaining pair in the area. So we show for this study that tree encroachment has occurred and it probably has occurred because of an increase in the growing season and that there has been a, a simultaneous decline in the number of wimbrel and that they show strong avoidance of trees. And are there any consequences then for those who do nest near the trees? When we looked and we just compared those that were successful and unsuccessful in terms of their habitat, there was no effect of distance to trees on nest success. And in general, with these birds here in Churchill, there's very low nest success, 20% of nests hatch. And we've looked at adult survival as well, a very relatively small sample size compared to the flamingo work that um, Miguel has done, but um, about 80% survival, which is low for, for a large shorebird like this. Now, there has been some uh, recent study of hunting pressure on these birds, particularly in the Caribbean and in northern South America where they, where they um, winter. And so it could be that, in fact, hunting pressure has some impact on, nest, on survival. Okay, so that, that's it for Wimbrel. And now I'm going to move on to Dunlin, a species that most of you are probably familiar with. Many Dunlin in this area in the winter time in um, right now, and they nest in less treed environments, and so there's usually a scattered tree here or there. And so we did a similar study with Dunlin, and uh, we have these alphanumeric markers so we can recite the birds, the individuals, and they nest in clumps of vegetation like this in the Churchill area. And they do avoid trees, so a similar sort of study. Uh, these are sites that aren't used, random sites, and these are sites that are used. And again, most of the nests are in areas with fewer trees than 40, and so low tree density. But are there consequences? Uh, again, just like the wimbrel, there are no consequences for nesting closer to trees. So this is the probability of a nest hatching. And in fact, some nests hatched even if they were in areas with relatively high tree densities. And so our measure of hatch, our success was basically whether they, they hatched. We did find, though, that there was an impact of concealment on the, or uh, not a significant in, impact, but there was a tendency for nests that were more concealed, especially from the north, because that's where the dominant wind comes from to be more successful. But no effect of trees, per se. OK, one of the things, uh, so thermoregulation may in fact be more important, at least at this stage, for Dunlin nest success and nest site selection. So one of the things I said I wanted to look at as well was to determine whether there is any additive genetic variants. So whether in individuals, if you look at them in, the, in their nest preferences over time, over several years, are they always choosing similar nest sites? And ideally, what you would want to do is plot the parent value against the offspring value. This is a classic heritability study. But we have so few offspring with this species that we can't really do that. And so the next best thing is to look at their repeatability. That is, if an individual is observed over successive breeding attempts, is it, uh, are they always picking similar areas to nest? But one of the problems is you really need to look at an individual the first time, la primera vez, que it, it chooses a nest site. And, that, and then you can't do that twice, because they only do it the first time once. So the next best thing is then to look at females, the repeatability of females, because when females, especially divorced females, because they are choosing new sites every time. They move very far from their previous site when they divorce. 
males are always at the same site and so they choose it once and then they're going to be there the second time, the third time, etc. But females that divorce in fact have um, an opportunity to, you have an opportunity to do this better. And so we looked at these repeatability measurements here and in fact for males and females they're both very, very similar but they're both pretty high. So this is a representation of the maximum heritability, so the maximum that is due to a genetic component of habitat selection and is pretty high, which suggests that natural selection could in fact favor moving this trait one way or another in response to uh, uh, habitat change. Okay, so I'm moving on now to another species. This is Phalaropus lobatus, and this is a species that maybe you would get in the Mediterranean, but mostly off the coast of Africa, once in a while in ponds. And this species we studied because, again, there was some, some concern. Here is an old photo uh, from 1949 showing a river system in Alaska where it's basically completely vegetated now. And so aquatic systems in particular, and this is an aquatic species, aquatic systems in particular are going to be impacted by both um, shrub and tree encroachment, but also this is, these are some pictures from uh, John Small, a Canadian who has been studying the high Arctic lakes, and he's found that because of increased evaporation, the, la the lakes in the Arctic are also disappearing, particularly the shallow lakes. Um, and so we were concerned about this species for that reason, because it is associated with Arctic wetlands. But also, for this reason, um, this is not the study species, <laughs> so these are, but in the Bay of Fundy, which is on the east coast of, of um, Canada, there were, up until the mid, or the early 1980s, millions Mionis de, of, of this species in the waters. And then there was a sharp precipitous decline. So there were only tens to a hundreds by 1986. So there was huge drop. And so some people thought, oh, they're going extinct. Down the tubes quickly. But, and so we were interested so in. Oh, this is during migration, yes, during migration. So the migration, migratory populations were declining very rapidly. And so that's what initiated this study in the Mackenzie Delta. Mackenzie Delta is one of the largest river systems in North America and one of the largest estuaries. And this is the Beaufort Sea up here, so way up, up here on this map. And so we studied these in conjunction with the Canadian Wildlife Service in a, a wetland area. So since we are particularly interested in uh, pond attributes because we thought ponds were disappearing, um, my student looked at ponds that were not used by phalaropes, were used only occasionally by phalaropes, or were used consistently by phalaropes. And with all of these different measures, she found no significant differences. So there was no difference in the depth of the ponds, the temperature, the percent of open water, or the conductivity, a measure of the chemi chemistry of the ponds. And so that wasn't very exciting. But we also then looked at the pond invertebrate biomass, and we thought, oh, they're at least selecting ponds based on the food, Los Camitas, but no. They're, the pond food is similar between these three categories as well and in both years. And there was no difference in the composition either. So it turns out that you have this wetland complex, and in fact, in the breeding season, there are distinct little um, ponds. But then in the runoff, when the snow melts, it's all one big wetland. And so the water just comes through all of this. And so that's probably why these uh, factors were not different. But again, we looked at habitat selection of the species. And in 2005 and 2006, we used a principal components analysis, which contrasted um, ponds that had more graminoid, more grasses, 
aquatic emergence in open water with those on the other side on more positive values with shrub and mud. And so that was the most important principal component. And so you can see that in both years, the nest or the home ranges were more in graminoid aquatic emergence in open water as opposed to shrub and mud. And it was stronger in 2006 than 2005. So they were selecting sites away from the shrubs, which are encroaching in these areas. And this is one of the only studies that my students have done where, in fact, what they select ends up making them more successful. So again, that same contrast in habitat, those birds that were more successful, the open squares here, more successful were ones that nested in graminoid and open water. Those that were less successful were ones that were closer to mud and shrub. Probably because foxes, vulpes, vulpes, can hide in the shrubs. And so um, now in 2006, something happened that we weren't expecting. And the river, the Mackenzie Delta, is right on the, the Beaufort Sea. And there was a tidal surge, and all the nests were flooded. And this is interesting because normalmente, normally in the Beaufort Sea, there would be ice throughout the breeding season. And only in July and August would there be water. But because of climate change, you're getting water earlier, and you get water um, flowing into these areas during the breeding season, during the period with, ne uh, with the nests. The other interesting thing about this is when there is a tidal surge, there is, just like in wetland areas in here in the Mediterranean probably and in the Atlantic, it actually reduces the shrubs because the shrubs do not like all the salt, don't like all the salt water. And so the flooding is good, but not when the nests are there. And so flooding is important to keep the habitat open for nesting phalaropes, but not, obviously, when the nests are there. OK, so the final habitat selection study that I'm going to talk about just briefly, because I'm going to talk about this species more later, is on the semi-palmated plover, Charadrius semi-palmatus. And this time, I'm taking you to the third study site which is that field camp with a bear fence all around it. And it's in James Bay, Jaime, Bayou de Jaime. Um, and we have a little field camp there. It's 53 degrees. It's quite far south, but this, the Arctic extends quite far south in northeastern North America. So this is more south than London, London England. OK, again, uh, we used a principal components analysis. And this time, um, the contrast, the main contrast, was between these higher gravel areas and the lower intertidal muddy areas. And again, plovers prefer the higher gravel areas for nesting. And these random sites are, are random sites in the wetter areas are not used as much. They are used a bit. But unfortunately, with this species, what we found is, now this is a little complicated, or complicado, pero these are failed nests, and these are successful nests. So failed are white, blanco, y successful negro. And you see that, this, again, the principal component here shows gravel on this side and mud on that side. And so you see that the successful nests were actually more muddy than the unsuccessful nests. And that's true every year. The successful nests are more muddy than the unsuccessful nests. And so they're on these nest, uh, muddy sites, and that's where they're doing better. And so it's an ecological trap. So they're, the sites they actually select, they're doing less well in. The sites that they, they are using uh, and not part of their long-term preference, they're doing better in. But the other thing is that every year, fewer and fewer successes, the black bars, fewer. And so the birds are 
more successful in those muddy sites, but they're, they are doing poorly in the site generally. More and more white bars or failed birds. And what's happening is, oh, just to point out that we've also done this repeatability for these birds, and it's very low, so very different than with the Dunlin. And we thought, are they learning? Are they going to more muddy sites after they failed in the gravel sites? No. So their first successful nest is no different than their second. And their first unsuccessful nest, they don't choose a different habitat. So they're not learning. And so what, um, why are the pebbled sites more vulnerable? So we think this is because vulpus vulpus is a species here in Nuevo Species Aquí, and it is uh, surviving the winter better because a warmer, much warmer winters, and so there are more of them, and they can find these little patches of gravel very easily, and then they depredate those nests. And so this is what we think is happening, and so the pebbled areas are becoming smaller because the sea water is coming in earlier, washing them away, and the nests are very conspicuous on these little gravel patches. And so we need to again look at aerial photos to see whether that in fact is true, whether the pebbled areas are disappearing. Okay, uh, talk a little bit more about this species because it's a good opportunity to look at uh, potential competition as well as a factor that can happen in the face of climate change. So killdeer is a larger Ceradrius species that nests exactly in places that the plover, semipalmate plover does not, or Ceradrius semipalmatus does not. So m more northerly species, more southerly species with a very large distribution. So are they competitors? And so this is a more detailed map, and this is from the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas, and this is a, a, a five-year government-sponsored um, atlas where people are sent into all these communities and down the rivers with canoes to monitor all the birds. And so very accurate measure of the distribution. And you can see in this area right in the overlap of the, the two species that they are in exactly the same places, pretty much. And we, if we look at killdeer over the years, killdeer, in fact, have increased by about 11% in occurrence in this area, the Hudson Bay lowlands. That's the area uh, of James Bay that I showed you. And the temperatures have also increased, not quite significantly, but the May temperatures have increased. And that's when the killdeer arrive. And this, these are our data of nest locations. And you see in 2003, these are plover, uh, semi-palmated plover, or Charadris semi-palmatus nests. And the yellow were killdeer. And so we had only three killdeer nests in this year. And then by 2007, the killdeer had spread out all through here, all the yellow. And then the semi-palmated plovers had disappeared. In particular, if you look at this spot compared to this spot, and this spot compared to this spot, you see that there's a, been a replacement of the two species over a very short time period. If we look at just their nest habitat differentiation, killdeer like higher areas, higher uh, areas, further from water, and with more trees, closer to trees than semi-palmate plovers, which nest further towards the, towards the bay, towards the water. And if you look at their success, very few killdeer nests flood because they nest in higher places. Um, hatching success is very low for both species. Uh, many uh, semi-palmate plovers nest flood. And this was a, a photo I showed earlier, and these nests are very vulnerable to high tide flooding. And in fact, over the years that we studied these, the number of flooded nests has increased and the number of hatched birds has that successfully hatching semi-palmated plovers has declined. 
Okay, and the timing of breeding as well. Um, Kildares arrive earlier, and remember I said that the May temperatures have increased, and so they can arrive earlier, set up nesting sites. The semi-palmated plovers are long distance migrants, and they nest later. But what I think is happening here is not that they're competing directly. Um, what I think is happening, here's the survival of semi-palmated plover in this, in this area and in Churchill, apparent survival. It's very, very similar. But I think what is happening is that these are the distances moved by males and females, if there's, I mean males, if they're successful or unsuccessful. Again, like many shorebirds, males do not move very far, regardless of what happens with their reproductive success. Females move far, so if females are more unsuccessful, they're going to move out of the study area. And I think that's what's happening here. So um, this is what happens to civil servants in, in Canada and maybe in Spain too. Slow attrition rather than direct competition likely explains the declines. So they're slowly just disappearing out of the study area. And I, I'm not sure that there's direct competition. Okay, the last little study I wanted to talk about is our test of the mismatch hypothesis. And this hypothesis is basically that there are peaks in food abundance and that it's best to hatch your chicks just before the peak in food abundance so that they grow fast, especially in an Arctic environment where it gets cold uh, later or relatively early, by the end of July, early August, it's already cold. And so it's important to grow quickly to, um, uh, to be able to get enough reserves to migrate. And so there are direct effects of climate on chicks of Arctic breeding shorebirds that are well studied. Um, about one third of the energy budget of an Arctic breeding shorebird is due to, is uh, devoted to thermal regulation. That is keeping warm. And then heat loss and metabolic rates increase substantially in high winds and so this all has to do with cold. So when it's cold, chicks have a hard, much harder time. And so this is important because what we did was we went and measured chicks, chick growth, uh, went and recaught chicks over time. And we have, uh, this is the best growth curve to describe this, it's not important to the story. But then we also measured food, and here's kind of the, uh, the phenology of the food, we measured them in pitfall traps, we measured both terrestrial arthropods plus low-flying arthropods, which were food items that were confirmed in the diet of Dunlin, and we sampled these every three days. And then we also measured, of course, weather variables, and we got those from the government, government sources. And then we created these two independent indices, so one for climate and one for the insects using a principal component analysis so that they were really independent. And then these are, with these, these are rotated principal components analyses. And so you can see the first one reflects temperature, the second one reflects, um, reflects the food supply. And then we used a model to look at both temperature, that principal component from temperature, and the one from arthropods. Um, and to see what the effect was on the growth, in particular the residual growth. And we, and we used, because all the shorebirds brood their young for at least five days, and so before five days of age, they do not have to thermoregulate because they basically, they, they go out and forage and then they come back and get warmed up, and then they go out and forage and they come back and get warmed up by their parents. So that's not a problem, so we divided the data into young chicks and older chicks and if you look at this, what we found is that the effect of temperature was stronger <coughs> excuse me, than the effect of food. And so if there is a warming climate, basically if it warms, the chicks will do better because it's warmer. They'll reduce their thermoregulatory costs. And then the effect of food, even though it was significant, is much less, significant, much less important to them. And so temperature, a rise in temperature, so this is a good news story for climate change. A rise in temperature, at least in the short term, will provide what we call physiological relief to the chicks, in the, even in the face of a mismatch between the food and the, and the um, phenology of the birds. So then just to sum up, 
the hypothesized negative biological effects to climate warming. I think this is the most important one. This is going to be the most important one. The structural components of the niche will become unfavorable. And I think that's how we're going to see the disappearance potentially of Arctic nesting shorebirds. Um, emerging competitors, predators especially, especially the high survival of vulpus vulpus of the fox, not to be underestimated in changing and lowering the um, productivity of Arctic nesting shorebirds. But I don't think that at this time the mismatch hypothesis, at least for the species we have studied, is very, very important. So uh, thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, I will take them. Thank you.